Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is November 14th. Well, I have to apologize for the little break I ended up taking from the show. We got hit with some viruses in our household, and then, of course, there was the whole effort to get the gardens put to bed, enjoying some visits from my college kids. Those were nice surprises. And then seeing PJ start his basketball season at Crown College. So very, very fun. But in any case, I wanted to start today's show out by talking to you a little bit about a book I had recommended in October. This is an old book. It's called Cream Hill, Discoveries of a Weekend Countryman by Louis Gannett. And I got my copy shortly after we celebrated Louis's birthday. He was a gardener. And I've been completely taken with this book. And if you're someone who likes to decorate with books for the holiday season, well, the cover of this book is absolutely stunning for Thanksgiving and Christmas. So the cover is a delightful faded orange, a really mellowed sort of rusty pink color. And the scene on the cover is one of snow-packed hills and a little farmstead. It's absolutely adorable. Here's what it says on the back of the book. One city man's Friday to Monday life on a Connecticut hilltop over the past 25 years. There is a chapter that's on the Cream Hill calendar. And here is a little excerpt of what he wrote for the month of November. And I thought you'd enjoy it. Lewis writes, In November, the earth waits. Summer has gone. Autumn has passed. Winter is not yet here. The season seems uncertain of itself. It is a good chore time. We rake the leaves again. We cover some of our more precious plants with salt hay. We bank the house. I put away the screen doors. With the grass brown and the trees bare, the rains sink into the earth and the hill spring flows again. I drain the bulky pump and motor at the maple spring. I finish stacking the wood in the cellar and begin to plan the winter's cutting. I fell a few sizable trees for working up in snow time. We pull up the bean and squash vines and the cabbage and the charred stumps and add them to the mulch pile in the corner of the vegetable garden and store the root crops in the cellar. I cajole neighboring farmers for a load of manure. Usually they begrudge their time more than their manure. We put away the porch furniture. The house ceases to be part of the outdoors world. It becomes a refuge against dark and cold. Fewer cars roar up and down the road. Cream Hill once more, is a world of its own, apart. When the earth rests, man wants to rest too. I rediscover the pleasure of sitting by a fire and reading. November, too, is walking time. The gardens are asleep. They no longer snatch at you as soon as you poke your nose out of doors. It was in November that I first found catch-all, the great rock slide, where Charles Gold told me he used to catch bobcat kittens 60 years ago. In the curious dry gulch, a waterless cleft in the rocky hill behind Hatcher Hughes Place, where moosewood, usually a shrub, grows 40 feet tall. In November, I spotted the dry brown leaves of yellow lady slipper in Phil Palangio's pines and I marked them for rediscovery in May when the ferns hide them. Isn't that sweet? So the book is called Cream Hill. It's by Louis Gannett. And if you can get yourself a copy, you'll love just having it sit out on an end table or coffee table or by your bedside this holiday season. All right, let's get to today's garden history. 
Today in Garden History, we start out by celebrating the birth of Xavier Bichat, the French anatomist and pathologist. He's remembered as the father of modern histology, or the study of tissues. In his work, Xavier did not use a microscope, and yet he still discovered 21 distinct types of tissues in the human body. His work accelerated and transformed the way that doctors understood disease. Sadly, Xavier died accidentally in his early 30s in 1802 after falling down the steps of his own hospital. Today, Xavier Bichat's name is one of the 72 names that are inscribed on the Eiffel Tower. A lover of nature, Xavier's work was grounded in observations of the natural world. Charles Darwin quoted Xavier in his book, The Descent of Man. He wrote, The great botanist Bichat long ago said, If everyone were cast in the same mold, there would be no such thing as beauty. If all our women were to become as beautiful as Venus, we should for a time be charmed, but we should soon wish for variety. Well, the beauty of nature and the secret to that beauty is thanks to nature's diversity and the ephemeral nature of all things, whether it's the seasons, flowers, the weather, etc. It was Xavier Bichat who wrote, Life is the sum of forces resisting death. And today, we also celebrate the birthday of Henri Dutrochet, the French physician, botanist, and physiologist. He was born on this day, November 14th in 1776. After studying the movement of sap in plants in his home laboratory, Henri discovered and named osmosis. Henri shared his discovery with the Paris Academy of Sciences, way back on October 30th in 1826. Like the cells in our human bodies, plants don't drink water. They absorb it through osmosis. Henri also figured out that a plant's green pigment, chlorophyll, is essential to how plants take up carbon dioxide. Hence, photosynthesis cannot happen without chlorophyll. And if you've ever asked yourself why plants are green, the answer is chlorophyll. Since chlorophyll reflects green light, it's what makes the plant and its leaves appear green. As for Henri, he was a true pioneer in plant research. He was the first to examine plant respiration, light sensitivity, and geotropism, or how the plant responds to gravity. For example, roots grow down to the ground. Geotropism can be a confusing topic to study at first, but I like to think of it this way. The upward growth of plants fighting against gravity is called negative geotropism, and the downward growth of roots growing with gravity is called positive geotropism. And here's another little fun fact related to the study of geotropism. There's a tiny part of the plant at the very end of the root that responds to positive geotropism, and it's called the root cap. So what makes the roots grow downward? It's that small but mighty root cap. It responds to positive geotropism. And today we remember Astrid Lindgren, the Swedish writer of fiction and screenplays. It's her birthday today. She was born on November 14th, back in 1907. Astrid is remembered for several children's books, including Pippi Longstocking. She wrote more than 30 books for children, and her work has sold 165 million copies. In fact, in January of 2017, Astrid's prolific work made her the fourth most translated children's author, trailing only Enid Blyton, Hans Christian Andersen, and the Brothers Grimm. 
Astrid was also, by the way, a flower lover, and you can see her love of the natural world, of blooming flowers, of trees, and of horticulture in general in many of her works. In her book, Mio, My Son, Astrid wrote, He turned to the master rose gardener and said something even more peculiar. I enjoy the birds singing. I enjoy the music of the silver poplars. And in her book, Most Beloved Sister, Astrid wrote, The flowers stopped singing and the trees stopped playing and I could no longer hear the brook's melody. Most Beloved Sister, said Elva Lee, when Salicon's roses wither, then I will be dead. And in Astrid's story, Buller Ben, the maid Agna tells a group of girls that if on midsummer night they climb over nine fences and pick nine different flowers in complete silence without speaking a single word and then return home and place the flowers under their pillow, they will dream of their future husband. Very sweet. Well, on social media, when I was researching Astrid, there is a marvelous picture of her climbing a pine tree. And in the photo, Astrid is 67 years old. She apparently climbed that tree in her front yard after being dared by her 80-year-old friend, Elsa. Astrid later quipped, There's nothing in the Ten Commandments forbidding old ladies to climb trees, is there? When she was in a more contemplative mood, Astrid once wrote, In our unknown past, we might have been creatures swinging from branch to branch, living in trees. Perhaps in the deepest depths of our wandering souls, we long to return there. Perhaps it is pure homesickness that makes us write poems and songs of the trees. And finally, today we celebrate the birthday of Harrison Salisbury, the American journalist who was born on this day, November 14th in 1908. After World War II, Harrison became the first regular New York Times correspondent in Moscow. He went on to win a Pulitzer Prize for his work. Harrison once wrote, My favorite word is pumpkin. You are a pumpkin, or you are not. I am. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, The Heirloom Gardener by John Forty. This book came out in 2021. And the subtitle is Traditional Plants and Skills for the Modern World. Modern Farmer gave a glowing review of John's book, writing part essay collection, part gardening guide. The Heirloom Gardener encourages readers to embrace heirloom seeds and traditions, serving as a well-needed reminder to slow down and reconnect with nature. The publisher writes, In the Heirloom Gardener, John Forty celebrates gardening as a craft and shares the lore and traditional practices that link us with our environment and with each other. Charmingly illustrated and brimming with wisdom, this guide will inspire you to slow down, recharge, and reconnect. Well, John's book is a charmer. In the preface, he shares how he became a gardener. And I always love hearing these origin stories. How do we become gardeners? Well, here's what John wrote about his early experiences. He wrote, Work at a garden center in my teens further ignited my interest in horticulture. It also helped me save up enough money to travel to Japan as an exchange student, far from my river and deep pine woods. There I saw the Japanese veneration of the land made manifest in regional artisanal foods, historic preservation, and the zen-like devotion to the craft of gardening, the art of placing a single stone in a garden wall or a budding branch 
in an Ikebana arrangement. I witnessed firsthand how much we are all shaped by place. When I returned, I explored garden history and ethnobotany with deep interest. Well, John's book is both entertaining and super informative, and he introduces the art and practice of heirloom gardening this way. Things like an old rhubarb patch, the remnants of an orchard, or a lichen-covered stone wall are talismans that help us read the landscapes we inherit. Through them, we catch a glimpse of how someone applied craftsmanship and the environmental arts to live in accordance with nature. As heirloom gardeners in our shared backyard, we remember the work our hands were born to do intuitively, like a bird follows its migratory path or a newly hatched turtle scrambles to the sea. I may be a romantic, but I do not romanticize the past. In my work as a garden historian and herbalist, I am not blind to the shortcomings, biases, and errors of earlier times, but I also see families connected to seeds and soil, people connected to place, and a deep value for living in concert with our environment. This book is an alphabetical collection of brief essays and artisanal images, and John says that he sees each entry as a point of connectivity, ancestor to descendant, seed to table. It's a love poem to the earth and a guidepost for gardeners who want to cultivate common ground and craft new possibilities from local landscapes. And I thought you'd get a kick out of hearing just one of the entries that John wrote. So we'll start with Angelica. And I loved what he wrote here. There's not time to read all of it, but I'll read this little excerpt and see if you don't learn just one new thing about Angelica. And by the way, this plant is one of my favorites in the garden. And I acquired it early on, probably about 20 years ago, as a volunteer in my garden. It probably hitched a ride with a plant that I got at a plant sale. John writes, A majestic herb is Angelica archangelica, cultivated through the ages for its flavor, fragrance, and stately beauty. In the garden, the hollow and resinous stems of this regal herb covered in broad leaves can easily tower three to five feet. That is very true and the enormous flower umbels rise up to seven feet toward the heavens, perhaps one of the reasons that the plant was dedicated to the archangels in medieval times. Early each spring in centuries past, Europeans and colonial Americans would harvest the tender stalks and then simmer them in a simple syrup. Eventually, the stalks would become the translucent light green of sea glass, and the syrup would take on the color and herbaceous balsam flavor that is so unique to Angelica. John writes, As lovers of spring have done long since, I repeat that process and candy the stalks until they become tender. I then either slice the stems lengthwise into short segments or braid them, braiding the long strands together before rolling them in fine ground sugar. They are excellent, served like membrillo or marmalade with cheese and dessert platters. Candied angelica was often served as a digestive at the end of feasts. And then John shares this little tip. He writes, Throughout the growing season, but especially in spring and summer, I enjoy serving gin and tonics and other cocktails with straws made from thinner angelica stems. I love that idea. And he writes, I also save the syrup that results from the candying process. It's an amazing herbal elixir to add to cocktails or to serve atop vanilla ice cream. Lovely, wonderful, great tips here. 
John's book is 264 pages of marvelous garden essays, beautiful botanical art about traditional plants and skills for the modern gardener. You can get a copy of The Heirloom Gardener by John Forty and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $8. Great deal. Great book. All right. We end the show today with a botanic spark that celebrates the birthday of the botanist Robert Buist, who was born on this day, November 14th in 1805. Robert came to America from Edinburgh, where his dad was a professional gardener. Robert had trained at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh and then immigrated to Philadelphia when he was just 23 years old. One of Robert's first jobs was working for a wealthy Philadelphia businessman who was named Henry Pratt and who had a beautiful summer estate that he called Lemon Hill. Now, at the time, Lemon Hill was regarded as one of the most beautiful gardens in the United States. This was in the early part of the 1800s. But eventually, Robert left Lemon Hill and he bought his own piece of garden history when he bought the nursery that was owned by Bernard McMahon. Now, that name should be familiar to you because the McMahon Nursery was one of the oldest nurseries in America, and it was that nursery that actually supplied plants to President Thomas Jefferson. Now, today, on the spot where the nursery used to be, there is a remnant, a little piece of history that is a nod to Robert Buist, because on that site, there is a large old Sephora tree that is called the Buist Sephora in honor of Robert Buist. The tree was brought to the United States from France, and its origin can be traced to China. Now, in addition to the nursery, Robert Buist grew his company to include a seed division and a greenhouse. And in 1825, Robert Buist became enamored with a brand new plant that the plant explorer Joel Poinsett had sent back to America. And when Robert Buist heard about it, he went and bought himself one, and then he began growing it. And it was none other than Robert Buist who named the plant the Euphorbia Poinsettia. And he did so because the plant had a milky white sap like other Euphorbias, and the second name, Poinsettia, was in honor of the man who discovered the plant, Joel Poinsett. And today, of course, the Poinsettia is still beloved. It was the red bracts of the plant that were so captivating to Robert, so surprising and unusual. And Robert Buist felt compelled to write about this plant. He wrote, it was truly the most magnificent of all the tropical plants we have ever ever seen. Well, I thought I would close out the show today with two other little stories about Robert Buist that I thought you'd get a kick out of. The first is that Robert Buist gave a poinsettia to his friend and fellow Scotsman, the botanist James McNabb. The story is as old as time. McNabb is in the United States. He visits a fellow countryman, a fellow plant lover, and then Robert does what most of us would do. We share one of our favorite plants with a fellow gardener. And so that's just what happened. James takes this precious poinsettia. He brings it back to Scotland with him, of course. And then he proceeds to give it to Robert Graham, the head of the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. Robert Graham ends up changing the botanical name of this plant. He calls it the Poinsettia pulcherima, the name it is still known by today. But Robert Buist was a proud man. And don't forget that he had formed this early and fierce attachment to the Poinsettia and, of course, to the name. He had taken pride in that name. And so this name change by Robert Graham was something that stuck in his craw. 
It was a move that disgusted Robert Buist for the rest of his life. And then the other little story that I wanted to share about Robert Buist was the fact that he was a garden writer. He was an author, and his books on gardening were very popular. In fact, when Stonewall Jackson, the great Southern general, discovered gardening in his midlife, he was around 40 years old, it was actually a book by Robert Buist that became his sort of garden Bible. Robert's book was called The Family Kitchen Gardener, and in Stonewall Jackson's copy of this book, he wrote all kinds of things, all little notes in the margins as he worked his way through all the advice that Robert Buist was giving about growing culinary vegetables. And like many gardeners still do today, Stonewall Jackson would write the sweetest little still relatable notes in the margins. He would write simply, plant this or try this as he was making his way through the different plants that were in Robert Buist's book. I find that so sweet. These were the plants that Stonewall Jackson wanted to try in his own garden. And of course, sadly, the Civil War cut all of that very, very short. But in any case, we end the show with a little celebration of the Scottish American who fell deeply and devotedly in love with the poinsettia, a plant that, of course, today is associated with Christmas and the holidays, and hopefully, a plant that will grace your home this holiday season. All right, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening to The Daily Gardener. And don't forget about that copy of Cream Hill by Louis Gannett. And just a reminder that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day.